good morning and welcome to another exciting chapter in the Northern Institute's People, Policy and Place seminar series for 2021. Uh, I'm Anna Ruth Wallace and I'm the Director of the Northern Institute and the Dean of CIFA or the uh, College of Indigenous Futures Education and the Arts. I'd like to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And for those of us here on campus in Darwin, that's the Larrakia people. We always pay our respects to Larrakia pe people and elders, past, present and future. And further extend that to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today and all of the places that you live and work on and the custodians of those lands and seas. Today we have a very exciting uh, presentation. Uh, one of my, the most inspirational people I know, a Northern Institute Research Act, Active Lecturer, Dr Tracy Woodruff. She will be discussing uh, teaching Indigenous learners and Indigenous knowledge and education. She does that from a depth of knowledge through research and practice over more years than she probably wants to mention, but it means that she's truly informed about what we need to be thinking about and helping everybody think think more creatively, more constructively and more positively about how we are all part of the future of Indigenous education. This seminar will outline monocultural and monolingual teaching practices that are used in mainstream classes and how the learning taking place can be very limiting and exclude Australia's rich history and First Nations people. She will ask us, how can we help teachers feel prepared and confident to teach in Aboriginal context, which is something that Tracy works hard on as part of her teaching and research work here at CDU. Just to note, there will be a Q&A session after the presentation. So when you think of questions that you would like to ask, please put them in the Q&A rather than the chat. The Q&A is at the bottom of your screen, uh, and that way we'll track them and we'll start to ask them when we have finished the presentation. So now, thank you very much. I'd like to hand over to you, Tracy. Thank you, thank you, Ruth. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning for this presentation. So it's my pleasure to speak to you all about my latest um, magazine column that I've written. So not only in research do we write uh, for academic journals, we also write for industry. So part of this, purpose of um, reaching out to different uh, publishing options is that we reach a wider audience and that our research work has impact in the industry that we're experienced in. So part of being a teacher or lecturing about teaching is then about making sure that what we find out in our research goes back to schools and teachers. So. I'm going to talk about my latest um, paper that I wrote today for Education Matters. So Education Matters is an online resource that's accessed by teachers and schools and they have an e-magazine and this e-magazine comes out in versions for primary teachers and context and secondary teachers and context. So um, this is the second item that I've had the opportunity to write for the magazine. And the first one really did make quite an impact and uh, reported some of my earlier research to do with uh, practicum and accessing that information that flows between pre-service teachers and the actual supervising teacher and that fantastic role that supervising teachers play in uh, ensuring that they model and they show how to demonstrate professional standards 1.4 and 2.4. So if you're not sure about what they are, so there are Australian professional standards for teachers and 1.4 and 2.4 are Indigenous specific standards that teachers are expected to be able to demonstrate as part of, of their professionalism in the classroom. So a lot of my work has to do with uh, teachers being able to demonstrate that they have an inclusive uh, classroom practice. So what I'd like to do first is just to bring out the PowerPoint. So I'm going to share my screen 
Okay. So Indigenous Australia in your classroom, which is something that can be quite paralyzing for some teachers who may not have experience in working in Indigenous context or feel like they may be underprepared in working with Indigenous students and Indigenous communities. So this takes up quite a lot of my um, thinking <laughs> in how to convey appropriate measures for people to use, but also how to make those measures um, habit or part of their everyday practice. So today I'm going to talk about an introduction and summary of teaching experiences, research and lecturing, focus areas and significance, diversity of Aboriginal culture in Australia, pre-service teacher education, which is one of the key target areas, overall teacher professionalism, and then just making a bit of a statement near the end there. If you don't know, make sure that you find out. So by way of introduction, I identify as being an Aboriginal Australian woman. My family are from Central Australia, so I'm a Warramunga literature woman. And my um, years of schooling and growing up, though, have not been sent, uh, in Central Australia. They've been in Darwin, so around the coast, but I'm not a saltwater girl. I am from Central Australia. Now, most of my teaching, funnily enough, in the Northern Territory has been in Darwin itself. Uh, when I first began, I had a posting in Catherine, and I began, even though I was primary trained, teaching in an early childhood setting, which was quite interesting. And actually, um, following those preschool students through to transition and then early childhood years while I was there in Catherine. So Catherine was a fantastic place to begin my teaching because the uh, collegial kind of um, environment and, and attitude there of a smaller community or a smaller town was fantastic for providing support and building that confidence in my early um, full-time teaching. We also were lucky because we had a variety of students who accessed our school. So we had students coming in from community and we also had students who were based at uh, who lived at Tyndall okay so we had a variety of indigenous and non-indigenous students who accessed our school and really that sort of encouraged me um, I think to develop my practice and think about how I catered for all my students and how I did that effectively um, understanding the different cultural backgrounds that they might come from uh, coming into Darwin then, I spent a lot of time in primary, but then secondary settings as well, and senior roles, so senior teachers, supervising teachers, and then um, a specialist teacher for behaviour management. So working on those skills that I'd learnt about engaging all sorts of students. So uh, I think that's really important for people as they build their knowledge. So developing uh, a focus in certain areas and especially for Indigenous students, you know, understanding how culture um, may impact on how you change your practice. So understanding each of your students as individuals and then modifying what you do as their teacher to provide the best learning for them. Because if they're not learning, you're obviously not teaching. Okay, you may not want to hear that, but if your students aren't learning, you're not teaching. So really, you know, we should understand teaching as a profession and it's something that you get better at over time and it's definitely an art that you develop. And I think Hattie probably explained that best when he said there are novice teachers, there are experienced teachers and there are expert teachers. And the difference between those three may not be clear, but obviously novice is new. You know, maybe you haven't built up um, you know, skills and uh, things that you learn over time. Experience is um, an interesting one because he said that just teachers who've been around for a long time doesn't necessarily mean you're any good at teaching. It just means you've been here for a long time. And in fact, some teachers who are experienced 
maybe should be those who retire. But the one that we're all uh, trying to aim for is that expert category, okay? Because experts are thought to have an intuition that helps them understand the content area that they're teaching to such a degree that they can scaffold and break it down to those smaller composite parts that students need, okay? So the students in your class have different needs and an expert teacher is meant to be able to know how to cater for all of those students. So we'd all like to be experts. And my teaching journey and my learning and thinking about how to be the best educator that I can be has taken me on a journey that includes a PhD. <laughs> so part of those early thinkings in my PhD, which was about the importance of including Indigenous knowledge in pre-service teacher education, was about thinking of the cultural elements in education. So what might make an Indigenous educator, someone who can make more links and cultural connections to Indigenous students. You know, there, if, let's just say, our current education system seems to be favouring non-Indigenous and perhaps not serving Indigenous students so well, what is that cultural element that we should be aware of and keep an eye out for? So that was where my thinking started. So as an Indigenous educator myself, what is it that makes me able to make um, connections perhaps with Indigenous students that might encourage them more or provide an environment that's more conducive for their success in education? So then I thought and I moved on to the next one, which is about creating an ideal classroom environment. So I tried to think of what are the bridges that we can build between knowledge systems. So obviously our westernised education system is based on a western knowledge system which has ideas and beliefs about what education should be learnt in school. So what are the things that should be learned in school to content? But then also the pedagogy. So western ideas about how learning happens and how teachers should teach or how students learn best. And when you really think about Australia and our cultural composition, you know, that way of learning or that way of teaching isn't very inclusive, okay? So I tried to then develop my ideas or understandings about different knowledge systems and how there might be a bridge between the two. How can we connect or link ideas and thinking that would create the ideal classroom environment? And when I say for Indigenous students, inclusive learning environments are not thought to be limiting to non-Indigenous students, okay? So when I'm saying inclusive or um, more ideal for Indigenous students, what I mean is more inclusive for everyone, okay? So Indigenous knowledge systems are thought to be engaging for non-Indigenous students as well when you're employing them in an educational context. So it's um, a bonus all around. Okay, so why wouldn't we do something like that and think of how to expand our ideas and understandings about education and teaching and learning? So moving on from that, you know, is well, how can we make that more obvious to everyone because one of the messages that we seem to receive and it's reported in the NADPA report, which is a report of teacher practicum experiences, and it was commissioned by the Australian Council of Deans of Education. Um, the report highlights that Indigenous context may be quite unfamiliar or foreign to non-Indigenous um, pre-service teachers, and that there may be a feeling of being unconfident, unsure, unprepared, so what is it that we can do to perhaps facilitate that through Indigenous educator voice? So Indigenous educators with a 
uh, understanding of education context. How could they then include their cultural knowledge and links in explaining how to perhaps improve teacher education? So that's kind of been a research focus for me as well, which leads to, you know, all of these um, advances or uh, progress in your research and your thinking add to or synthesize, you know, your knowledge about this issue of Indigenous perceived um, or perceived Indigenous underperformance in education. So how can we keep building on uh, ideas and thinking and, um, you know, do that through research so that the statements we're making are supported through research evidence. So that's the kind of journey that I've been on. And as I've moved through these other um, publications, you can see, you know, the ideas that I'm extending and developing on. But the main focus that I have is about improving education outcomes for Indigenous students. So if I stop sharing that particular document with you for a second, I'm just going to move that out of the way and I'm going to get back to the article that I started from. So I hope you can all see this article now. So the way I started was to highlight that, you know, there may be an issue with our classrooms at the moment. And the thing is that um, you know, the majority of teaching staff in our schools are non-Indigenous. That's a fact. And the education system itself is based on assisting student knowledge in standard Australian English, which makes assumptions that everyone starts with that same starting point of being proficient in standard Australian English, which isn't true. We all know that's not true. So if people have quite a narrow view, and in fact, um, I'm, I'm going back to, to teachers now. So teachers in classrooms, if perhaps they have a limited experience of working with Indigenous people or having um, experience with Indigenous context or content, then really the classroom um, discourse is limited, okay? It seems to limit or it's Exclude all the potential that's contained within Australia's rich history of its First Nations people, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So then I try to convince people who maybe may say, <laughs> by going into the second paragraph and producing some stats. So I'm not really about stats, I'm about people's stories and about individuals and individual students, but you know. Every now and then we throw in some stats to help people feel if what we're saying is true. So only 3.3% of Australians identified as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander in the 2016 census. And you know, perhaps in the bigger urban centres, you know, colonial attitudes and bias might have you think that Indigenous Australians don't live everywhere in Australia. They only live in remote areas, so we don't really need to know about them or know about Indigenous Australians. Well, that's not true, okay? And by no means so am I diminishing Aboriginal people who live in remote areas or any issues or education issues that um, exist for Indigenous people who live in those locations. But what I'm trying to say is that teachers who work in urban centres cannot say that they don't need to know about working with Indigenous students or know about Indigenous content or context. They do, okay? Because the truth is that 79% of Aboriginal Australians live in urban areas and the vast majority of Aboriginal children receive their education in government schools. So it's everyone's responsibility to know how to make that teaching experience or education knowledge relevant to all Australians. Teaching practice and teaching knowledge needs to include all Australian citizens. 
so that's Torres Strait Islander and Aboriginal peoples as well. But not all teachers feel confident with that. We've discussed that, okay? And one of the diversity um, complexities there, I suppose you might say, is that not everyone who identifies as being Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander will be living in their ancestral land, okay? So as a result of colonisation, many people were dispossessed and displaced and moved to missions or homes and stolen as a matter of government policy. Now, I'm not putting that there to be argumentative or to make anyone feel bad, but what we really need to do is understand, recognise, accept Australia's true history, understand what that means for Indigenous identity today and for Indigenous people living all over Australia and how that might play out or be relevant for teachers to know and how that impacts on classroom practice. So part of that truth about Aboriginal Australia is acknowledging the true history of what happened to Aboriginal people, understanding what that means for them now and how that might play out in the classroom. So you do not make assumptions about your students in your classroom. You have to know them all as individuals and understand where they are from, okay? So you might think, oh, what's she talking about where they're from? They're from here. Well, they may have strong connections, may or may not, may have strong connections to country that is somewhere elsewhere. They may also have strong links and connections to their language and language groups from that country. So you can't just make assumptions about Indigenous students. For example, teachers in Darwin urban schools may wonder why they can't just treat all students as Larrakia, because that would be disrespectful. Because you will have students from numerous locations throughout Australia who may or may not identify as Indigenous. If they do identify as Indigenous, you can't assume that because they're living here in Darwin that they're like here. So understand your students as individuals and then find out what their cultural links and connections are and ask them to explain that to you. So one of the worst things you can do is to define or categorise an Aboriginal person, okay? We want to explain who we are ourselves. And we want to talk to you about identity as we define it ourselves, not as other people might categorise us. Because we had that in past government policies with racism and racist terms that are often still used today. Okay, which again is limiting for Indigenous people. Okay, don't do that. All right, so what I move on to next after we've touched on those kind of heavy, uncomfortable topic is to move quite quickly into what is something practical that teachers can do, okay? So how can we work together on a shared history moving forward? So teachers can join those reconciliation efforts, all right? And then I give examples of that. What can they actually do? And I provided some links in the article because you know, when you're working in your classroom with students, quite often you want to bring up something that's in a, in a interactive or visual, something that you can use with your students, something that you can actually do, all right? So um, that's an important thing to point out. So we don't just want people to talk about being culturally competent or hope that they can work towards being culturally competent. You know, cultural competency is a journey and I don't actually like you know, to think we can just give someone a certificate after a half day course and say, oh, you're culturally competent because it's not really, is it, um, you know, a true reflection of the situation. Being culturally competent, aware, um, responsive, reflexive, uh, is kind of like a journey, isn't it? So it's something constant and dynamic. It's not something you can just tick off and say, yep, I can do that. So we want people to understand that it's something that we're all working towards and it's part of that 
commitment to reconciliation. How can we find the positives in ways to move forward? So it's the action that counts, not the words, not the rat plan on the shelf. It's your action. So what can you do? So teachers in classrooms can do this. They can at least know the traditional owners of the land that they're on, where their classroom and school is situated, and learn how and when to say an acknowledgement of country. Okay, so people get mixed up between a welcome to country and acknowledgement of country. Find out what an acknowledgement of country is and try to do it. Make a point of teaching it to your own class so students feel that they understand what that is, why you're doing it, and if um, you know, it came down to it, the students could do an acknowledgement of country themselves. There's plenty of resources that can help you understand about that. So there's a Ganbei map of Australia's first languages, which is an interactive language map. It's brilliant. Okay, there's Reading Australia resources. So Reading Australia is a project by um, Harlia. So the Australian Lecturers in English Association, I hope I got that right. Anyway, so Reading Australia is a project about um, creating units of work that go along with particular texts for primary and secondary age students. And Magabala Books, which is an Indigenous publisher, has got some of their texts that Reading Australia has used and have uh, incorporated units of work that are really um, very well laid out, easy to use in the classroom. And they help teachers feel empowered about how to teach Indigenous content and um, give really good advice about how to incorporate Indigenous um, people and Indigenous communities and Indigenous concepts or perspectives into the teaching of those units for books that have been written by Indigenous authors. So there are fantastic resources for people to access and for you to feel empowered in your role as an educator. You know, there are different um, ways or pedagogies used or employed to teach math and science that are inclusive. Have a look at that, okay? You might want to ask, educators might want to ask their students, you know, do you know about David Unipon and why he's been on the $50 note? What did he do? That's so fantastic. Ask questions. Find out about, you know, prominent Indigenous people and make that evident in your classroom that these people are respected and why. You know, there are other areas that you can touch on like Indigenous astronomy, okay? So make links between knowledge systems and build bridges and incorporate and embed Indigenous people into education, all right? We don't want to feel like we're on the periphery and like we need to ask permission to engage. Okay, so moving on from that, you know, working on being culturally responsive, reflective, or competent, whether you're doing any of that, teachers in the Australian teaching workforce are expected to know about Aboriginal Australia. Now, I say Aboriginal because I'm speaking from the perspective of an Aboriginal woman. So you're expected to know about us and about our history and about our cultural strength. Okay, don't have deficit blinkers on. So you need to know and respect Aboriginal culture and diversity and ensure that content is taught appropriately. Knowing how Aboriginal students learn best to ensure that the students have that best chance of academic success and having knowledge of responsive teaching practices and how cultural considerations impact on learning. Yes, so important, okay? Can you demonstrate professional standards 1.4 and 2.4? And if you don't know about 
have a look at that as well. Okay, so it talks about being able to work with students from culturally diverse backgrounds and working with students who speak other languages. So find out about those if you haven't already. To finish off the article and to, to provide that feeling of people being able to, you know, act on what it is that they're trying to um, understand about, I put in my five top reads. Now I tell you this mail-in article is something that pops up to me all the time and people say, but that's outdated, Tracy. And I say, read it, okay? It will give you the answer. So what is a good teacher? So Meredith Malin conducted some research and this article breaks it down about what Indigenous parents or Aboriginal parents think is good teaching practice, what they expect for their students, for their children, okay? And how they expect the teacher to show a particular level of respect in the classroom. But the article also then compares the non-Indigenous or the non-Aboriginal points of view about teaching. And really, if anything, this article highlights the cultural differences in educational expectations. And if you didn't think there were any, you read this article and you will know that there are. The next two sources that I highlight there are textbooks. Okay, so the first one by Price and Rogers is a textbook that I'm using in my core unit for um, the degrees and it's um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Education. So it's a textbook that unpacks complex concepts for students who are studying EST 203, Teaching Indigenous Learners. And when I look for a textbook, I don't only look for books that give theory. I really want practical elements that are embedded within the chapters so that students not only hear what those kind of things might be, but they get to incorporate or practice them by following the practical descriptions uh, embedded within those textbooks. The next one, the Harrison and Selwood one, is the same, okay? So unlike the Price and Rogers text where both the editors are Indigenous, Harrison, Neil Harrison is non-Indigenous, but Juanita Selwood is a Torres Strait Islander woman and she provides that other element. So we can talk about, you know, Indigenous people and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But when I deliver the learning to the students, I'm giving the information from an Aboriginal perspective. So bringing in that Torres Strait Islander understanding is important as well. And that text for my master's level students, EST 503, is very good at adding that extra element. And the practicalities of that text are very good too. So both texts have interactive links. They have focus questions, which really bring in um, pre-service teachers focus to understand particularly relevant concepts to the classroom, okay? Concepts that are classroom appropriate and deal with case studies and really give a practical understanding, okay, so if this is the theory or the beliefs behind this, this is how I can implement it in my classroom. Beresford, Partington and Gower is such an easy text to read. You can't go past that text, okay? So easy. Some academic type articles, when you read them, are like waiting through months. You read Beresford, Partington and Gower and it is enjoyable. It is. <laughs> to read and find out about Aboriginal Australia to it, okay? They touch on some sticky and uncomfortable concepts, but all of those are important to know about. And then I've um, sort of blown my own trumpet a little bit there <laughs> with improving Indigenous student outcomes through improved teacher education. So that last article is really a summary of my um, PhD thesis. 
and at the Q1 Journal. That one's a very happy and international Q1 Journal. So if you haven't had a look at that one, have a look. So that list is not exhaustive, but it's a good practical way for improving professional knowledge about cultural aspects of Australian education for teachers. So, you know, we want teachers to improve their professional knowledge. We want them to understand the implications of knowing about Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. And we want to know why, we want everyone to know why that's so important. And the main thing that's underscored there is because it supports student success. Okay? That's what it's all about. So there are some other resources and always, you know, the reference list is really good to look at too. So obviously the stats I got from the ADS website. This, Martin, Whitney, Haddam and Diplock, um, text is brilliant. And it's about being culturally responsive and about incorporating that into pedagogy. So very, very good practical tips there, but one that really um, makes links to other literature and sources and how we can move the Australian teaching workforce in that direction. Because April, so our Australian Institute for School and Teacher Leadership are moving very heavily towards a culturally competent teaching workforce. And I know that because in uh, the Northern Institute, we wrote their literature review that started the ball rolling in that space. So then Santoro, she always writes very interesting pieces um, about cultural diversity. And one of her better texts that I uh, like to reference is Outsiders and Others different teachers teaching in culturally diverse classrooms. And then the last one is the research that the NADPA report was based on, the NADPA report that I mentioned during the our conversation earlier. So some really um, to the point kind of statements that I've made in that article, but for a good course, okay? So we don't have time to dilly dally around. We need to get to the point and change things for Indigenous people in education in Australia. We need to make changes, systemic change. Okay, so if you're looking for the article that I've um, just gone through. It's going to be published in the next um, edition. But if you go to the Education Matters website, you can see the past magazines that they've had. And in fact, the earlier article that I wrote is in this edition here. So it was published in March. I hope this is going to come up a little bit slow. Okay. So you can see it's very easy to access the magazine. And then when you open it up, this is the article here, okay? So on page 28, the important role of supervising teachers to improve Indigenous education outcomes. And it's all really about that important aspect of the supervising teacher having discussions with the um, pre-service teacher about, you know, which um, professional standards are you going to demonstrate uh, in this crack, which ones are we looking at, and making sure that they have conversations about professional standards 1.4 and 2.4, and then looking at how so supervising teachers have the important role of modelling the demonstration of those professional standards. I'll bring my presentation back up. We took a detour from that, I hope you don't mind. 
So does it really matter that teachers know about the diversity of Aboriginal culture in Australia? Yes. And one of the reasons that I might not have explained very well was the fact that there are probably different pedagogical approaches that are relevant to different communities and that if teachers understand where they are and whose ancestral lands they're on, which language group or language is spoken in that region, which people do they need to engage with, and they be able to have very constructive educational conversations about pedagogical approaches that are employed or that are culturally appropriate for that region. So there's this that I wanted to show you. So the Australian Council of Deans of Education are actually advised by an Indigenous group who are lecturers in teacher education and they're called Alatia and they help to create these resources that teachers could use to build their confidence but also their capacity in teaching and use as a resource in the classroom with their students. So there are resources and movements about knowing more about Aboriginal Australia. You just have to look for them and you have to want to know what they are. So thank you very much for listening today. I hope that you found the talk informative and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you and thank you everyone who joined today. Um, I'll just get out of my PowerPoint. Thank you very much, Tracy. That was uh, really fantastic and also doable. It's actually things that people can take away and work on and think about in their practice. One of the things I wanted to ask you, I'm going to be a bit rude and take Chair's privilege, how do you stay resilient and how did you stay resilient in the system when asking to do these things, working to do in different ways, may not always be received positively by the school you work in? So thank you for that question. Um, I think it probably goes back to my personality. I'm quite a practical person. So if something's not working out, I want to know why it's not working out and I want to know how I can fix it. <laughs> I know things aren't always fixable, but there's always something that we can do, some action we can take and some way that we can try and improve a situation. So that's just maybe a personality thing I suppose. Um, really, you know, it probably goes back to the one question I get asked quite a lot. Tracy, what do you love most about teaching? And I'd have to say it's the children or the students and then they say, well, what's the main thing we have to do, you know? And I say, you just have to care. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really important. And I think there's something about building alliances as well. Have you done some work about building alliances within schools so that you're not on your own all the time trying to bring through this knowledge so what people yep. can do with their teams? Yeah, so working with the TRB at the moment is fantastic. So one of my recent research projects had to do with thinking about a tool that teachers might be able to utilise um, when they're having their professional conversations or when they're talking, um, you know, in that supervisor, pre-service teacher kind of situation. So I have an ongoing relationship with the PRB and that is now an ARC um, research application, which I'm sure about soon. And um, even if that's not successful, I've managed to make a relationship with the TRB and to um, sort of disseminate that knowledge and information about, you know, what we might need to look at or think about and how we could possibly do that in conjunction with the Department of Education. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Um, um, Amy Leanne is asking about, well, she's actually commenting on that as use of technology. So did you want to talk about how we adapt technology to improve 
students' learning and engagement and move to that deeper learning and it doesn't become a way to keep people busy. Yeah, okay. So I think um, one of the interesting things um, as a teacher that I realised is you know, early on we expect students to learn how to read. But the reason that we do that is because when they reach a certain stage in their schooling, they're expected to then use that skill of reading to learn for themselves. So, you know, teaching someone how to fish, <laughs> that analogy, teaching someone how to read. So building that um, efficacy, into working with all people, so all the students that I teach, building that efficacy into how they can then um, be more self-reliant in moving forward. I think technology plays a big part in that. So some people, you know, they don't like computers or, or phones or whatever because they're scared of it, you know. I always think if you jump in and you have a go, you know, you might break it, but you might not. And Learning something for yourself to then be able to use those skills later, you know, um, independently is something that's very important. Yeah, it's so important. And, and being able to make mistakes and continue to work with people and say you're sorry and, and working through it is so important. Um, there's a question about working in partnership with elders, with Aboriginal groups outside the school. Um, how do you do that effectively without burdening some of the elders who would like to be involved but get asked to do absolutely everything? Okay, so I like to um, discuss what an elder is, okay, because some people who are not informed or don't know think that every old person, old in business person is an elder. And I think it's really important to explain that an elder is a person within the Indigenous community who has particular knowledge and responsibility for particular cultural practices. They hold a certain position of respect. And explaining and understanding that then makes it easier to tell people you may not have access to an elder. <laughs> You can, though, go through your Aboriginal Islander education worker located within schools to know who's there in the community to contact and to talk to and to be able to access uh, community knowledge that way. And that if you are, in fact, wanting an elder to come into your classroom, Expect that you'll be paying them for their knowledge and their skills and their time. Yeah, and I think you can also work with agencies that are have that are around. If it's not there's not elders to work with, there's other agencies. So they, I think also we can think more creatively and work with what works with people. It's got to work with what people want to do and feel confident to do and are available to do. Because yeah, some people get asked to do everything, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, and I think um, reciprocity is an important thing to remember. So quite often when I give a talk like this, um, afterwards I feel, I don't know, a little bit deflated, which sounds funny because, you know, you think you're on a buzz, but there, I think as an Aboriginal person you reach a point where you give away all your knowledge and you feel that you haven't been given anything in return. So there's that one-way kind of communication which I think is not very respectful and not very helpful. So, you know, it's like expecting Aboriginal people to be the main drivers of reconciliation. Or it's always asking the Aboriginal person in the room to explain racism. You know, hello, excuse me. <laughs> I might be on the receiving end of it, but someone else knows how to do it really well, you know. So think about those things. I think that's an important starting point. Uh, we've got a question about deficit thinking and the way some courses are, are, are shown a lot of stats and a lot of information which builds a, a deficit presentation um, and uh, it can then lead into people, students feeling or professionals feeling like they're going to come and save everybody. They're, they're jumping on their horse and here they come. So how do we help people think more strategically 
and more humbly about their role uh, and, and, and instead of trying to step in and take over, but actually start to work in partnership and in ways that may, they may never have expected to do. Okay, so generally people act like that because they think they know best, so they're not really honouring the Indigenous knowledge that's already helped Aboriginal people survive and flourish in Australia for over 60,000 years before the British arrived, okay? So we didn't get saved <laughs> by the British. <laughs> I think if we just go back to that point, you know, it might be a good starting point. Um, also, understanding that you know, when you come into a situation, those deficit statistics kind of have a purpose. And the purpose is for the wider non-Indigenous population to stop and think that Indigenous people may not have been given the same opportunities and so don't have the same starting point, um, you know, specifically in education as you know the assumptions that they might make in the classroom you know where all the students have had this opportunity and you know there's there's a reason behind that deficit reporting and it's just for people to be aware that not everyone has may have had the same opportunities in their life and that there's also intergenerational trauma that might continue to impact on some people's attitudes for um, engagement. I think that's important, but yeah, understanding that Indigenous voice is important in what we do and it kind of balances the scale if we're understanding situations from different people's perspectives. I know a lot of the time. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to run to my next meeting. I just think it's just been fabulous. I'm going to uh, hand over to Katrina. There's a couple of questions there about um, the things that are different in different parts of Australia, uh, the impact of stolen generation to colonisation, and what do you think about the culture that's being taught from schools from the schools where a person is Aboriginal. I don't really understand your question, Debbie, sorry. Um, who is not Aboriginal? So how do you feel about non-Aboriginal people leading Aboriginal studies programs? Um, but I'm sorry, I have to belt, so I'm going to ask Katrina to um, to finish uh, after this last question, it's a very important one. And I just want to acknowledge what a fantastic presentation, Tracy. I learned something every time I'm around you. Thank you. Thank you, thanks very much, Ruth. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and answer that question. How do I feel about Aboriginal studies being taught by a non-Aboriginal person? Well, I would say that it's really important that what they teach is informed by an Indigenous voice. So as much as I can, I access Indigenous academic sources and try to understand or convey a theme, a concept from an Indigenous perspective. Now if a non-Indigenous person is delivering and feels that they can't do that well, then they should of course be um, working in perhaps a team teaching situation or a situation where there's a mental opportunity for an Aboriginal person or an Indigenous person to provide that insight into an Indigenous perspective because if there's one thing that I definitely believe in is that non-Indigenous people cannot have an Indigenous perspective. You can't understand what it's like to spend your whole life being treated like an Aboriginal person. And I might just stop there. <laughs>